Well, welcome to Encounter Church, and we are blessed to have you join us wherever you are. And uh, here at Encounter Church, we believe whether it's your first time or whether you've been here forever, that God wants to encounter you with his love, his presence, and his grace. So uh, we just want to bless you. If you happen to have a testimony while you're watching the service, please contact the church office. We'd like to share and uh, there are a lot of ways to connect. You can uh, connect through our website, EncounterChurchPA.org, on the Encounter Church app. Uh, there's Encounter Church on Facebook. The youth have a Facebook page as well as our, our uh, kids' church. Or you can email the office, and that information is behind me. Uh, we've had some questions of people asking, how can we be involved in helping the community? And so as a church, we're connected to Solanco Neighborhood Ministries. Uh, they provide food and for families in need. And so uh, non-perishable food items, there's a list of things that they would like. So you can bring those items, drop them off here at the church, Mondays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or uh, possibly there directly. Also, Easter is coming. Easter's right around the corner, and we're having a wonderful time just preparing. And uh, we're going to be having a Good Friday service this coming Friday. That'll be online. We want to encourage you to tune into that. There's going to be special music, a message. We're going to be taking communion together as a body. So I want to encourage you, get your communion elements, your bread and your juice ready. And uh, you can join us through the Encounter Church app, our website, YouTube, or you'll be mailed an, uh, an email link if you're on our email as well. Uh, the children are invited this Tuesday to pick up uh, children's Easter bags. And they're going to be available this Tuesday, April 7th, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. here at the church. So please come through and get those. And um, so again, uh, any of these announcements, you want to, to check these out, you can look online. You have the, the video that you're looking at now. And... Um, so that's all good as well. We believe in Encounter Church that giving is a part of our worship. So obviously, uh, they didn't have a church online giving back in the, in the Bible times, but we do now. So you can either give online, you can give through the Encounter Church app, or you can mail check to the office. And I just want to invite you wherever you are to really engage. Let's engage with the worship. Let's engage with the message. So uh, even if you're in your living room or your den, be, feel free to stand up, walk around, uh, or kneel, or even prostrate yourself. But just, let's just worship the Lord and invite his presence to come. Father, we thank you for how wonderful, how precious, how powerful you are, how willing you are, Father God, to interact and engage with and, and Lord, just to, to love your people. And God, whether, whether uh, we know you or, Lord, or we're on our journey at a, at a beginning place in our spiritual journey, Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would engage us, your love would be real to us, and God, that we would uh, fully encounter your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him. It's time. 
It's good to encourage our soul <laughs> to worship, to praise. Thank you, Jesus, for your worthiness, oh God. God, you're so matchless.
So uh, last evening I was, uh, I just decided instead of going on Facebook, instead of uh, doing whatever else I do in the evening, I, I decided to go to my office and, and just get before the Lord and, and uh, got my Bible and just started praying. And the Lord began to show me, you know, there's so many things that we could say about the, the situation today. Um, for instance, I gave my granddaughter a, a gave her a Christmas gift to go see King and Country at Hershey on April 18th and it got postponed and she was devastated and you know I got to thinking wow is this going to happen and it goes it could go on and on and on and and we really don't know and I was bringing this before the Lord and said you know Lord I, I don't want to fall into this place of being scared or fearful and, it, and the Lord took me to this uh, verse in Revelation and and just began to show me that, you know, you know, it's, there's so much going on. And I said, Lord, where do you want me? He was ta I was talking about me. And he said, I just felt like I need to read in Revelation. In Revelation 2, it's the church of Ephesus. And he was telling Ephesus all the wonderful things they've done. You know, you, you tested the, and claimed to uh, see the false prophets and all those. And down through, you bravely endured trials and persecutions. But in verse 4, he said, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Think about how far you've fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. I will come to you and remove your lampstand, lampstand from its place of influence if you do not repent. And I, I just got to thinking about my life. When I gave my life in 1994, I was, there was about three years that I was so passionate for Jesus. I was so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus. There was even a time in my life where I, I, I went to a bookstore and bought five different versions of Bibles and a Strong's Concordance, and that's what I did for about three years and just burned in my heart. And I began to realize last night how, how easy it was over the past 10, 15 years for me was how, how I just kind of drifted away from that first love. and. Uh, never really was a football fan and all of a sudden found myself just crazy about football and not that football's wrong but just just that first love and last night I found myself just crying out to God for that first love Lord I want that first love I want that intimate relationship and so I encourage you I encourage you I think it starts you know judgment starts at the house of God and you know what if God is wanting to do something through this situation so I encourage you uh, you know, check our own hearts and say, how is your love? How is your intimacy? What was your first love like? And I just encourage us all to go back to that moment of that first love. It's just like when you first met your wife or your girlfriend. It's, it's tingly. It's fresh. And I think that's what the Lord's asking um, this morning. We just look to you, Lord. We just remember 
what you have done for us, Lord. Lord, uh, yeah. May we just, yeah, go back to our, that first love, Lord. Um, just the hunger and the thirst of you, Lord Jesus. Lord, yeah, we just look to what you've done, Lord.
my song of praise will rise to my champion, my rescue. Let's look to him this, this morning. Glory to the Lord on high. There is no one, there's no one like you. Because here's my song. Lord, we just thank you, Jesus, that you've washed us in your blood, God. Jesus, we thank you that when you look at us, you see us innocent, God. Lord, as we enter this Easter time, God, we just remember what you've done for us, Jesus. We just remember what you paid for us, Jesus, God, and we just thank you, God. We remind ourselves this morning, God, that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, God. Come on, do you believe that this morning, that he washed you, that he cleansed you? Manny was talking about returning to our first love. God, we remember that first love when you first washed us and first cleansed us, Jesus. We thank you for who you are, and we declare you are the Lord on high. You are our champion and our rescue. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Thank you, worship team. Come on, that was so good. Such a good time of worship. Um, man, I just feel like that song is so fitting uh, with us coming into this time of Easter this week. You know, today is Palm Sunday, uh, and then we're coming up next Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. This is Easter week, which I'm just so excited. I I've, I've been chomping at the bit, actually, to be able to share the word during Easter week, because this is like, this is the Super Bowl up for us as Christians. Like, this is the big kahuna week for us. I'm excited. I'm ready to share the word. I'm going to try not to walk right off camera here. I'm sure I just did. So I'm going to try to pace like I always do, but stay right here in the middle of the camera for you guys. Um, but I'm just excited. How many of you know that Easter is about more than a, cho than, than a bunny who pops out chocolate eggs? Right? I, I don't know who came up with that. I think the pagans came up with it. But if I, like, I think any 10-year-old or any 5-year-old, you know, is probably thinking, you know, you know, bunny, what are these eggs made of? I don't know. But anyway, I, I don't know. You ask your kids. But uh, anyway, so it's about a lot more than that. It's about Jesus 
going to the cross. It's about the King, the Messiah, being willing to lay down his life for us so that we could be saved. And it's about not only that, not only him dying, but him being resurrected so that the power of his resurrection life can fill us and transform us and defeat death and sin in our lives. And this week, we get an opportunity to pause, kind of like at Christmas we remember the fact that Jesus came in the form of a man, we get a chance right now to pause and remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's amazing. So today is Palm Sunday, which I'm going to talk about. This coming um, Thursday is people, the Catholics or, or a lot of Christians call it Maundy Thursday. It's the day that Jesus had his last supper with his disciples. It's the day that, that he, he washed their feet. And then that night he was betrayed. And then this coming Friday is what we call Good Friday. It's the day Jesus was crucified. And we remember his death. We remember the way he bled for us, the power of his blood. On Saturday, he's still in the grave. Right, and we remember the, the pain of death, right? And then on Sunday, we rejoice, amen? amen. Because he's risen. He's risen indeed. Amen? amen? Come on, it's gonna, it's gonna be great. So, you know, that, that's what I wanna talk about this morning. I wanna, I wanna take an opportunity, wherever you are, whether you're in your living room, whether it's even still Sunday morning for you, maybe it's Sunday afternoon, maybe someone sent this message to you or, or this service to you, and you're checking it out. I'm, I'm thankful. That, that you're inviting us into your home with your family or, or your bedroom or wherever you are. Um, but this morning, I really want us to, to focus together and take time to remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. The love, the forgiveness of God that he showed for us on the cross. So today, okay, so let's start. Today is Palm Sunday, right? Today, today is, is, is a day where we celebrate this event of Jesus riding on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. So, so Jesus has, has been doing his ministry. He's been out all, he's gone all throughout Israel, right? He comes, he says, you know, he's proclaiming the kingdom. He's showing people that he's the Messiah. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's raising the dead. And, and, and then, and Jesus is building this following all throughout this time. Sometimes Jesus will come into a town and he literally can't even move around because there's so many people just like gathering around him. There's so many people pressing on him. And now, and, and, and people are beginning to make this realization, oh my goodness, this guy's the Messiah. They see the works that he's doing. They see the authority that he teaches with. And they're like, this guy's the Messiah. And so Jesus is coming. This is kind of like the climax of Jesus's ministry in some ways. He's coming back home to, to, the, to the, well, not home. He didn't grow up there, but he's coming to the city of God where they literally receive him as the Messiah and the coming king that they've been waiting for. It's kind of a crazy moment, actually. Right? He, he, he comes with this huge crowd, and this is what it says in the book of Mark. It says, and they brought the cult. So G there's the prophecies about, about the Messiah all throughout the Old Testament, and one of them is that he'll ride into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, right, on a colt on the colt of a, of a donkey, right? And it says, they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on it, right? They're taking off their clothes and they're putting it on the donkey the same way that you would hail a king who's coming into a city, right? And it says, and he sat on it and many even spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields, right? So people are taking off their clothes as an act of humility and saying, Jesus, you're the king. You're the Messiah that we've been waiting for coming into the city of God to take the throne, basically. That's what they're proclaiming. And they're laying down their cloaks in humility. They're, and that's where we get Palm Sunday, right? They're cutting palm branches off of the trees and they're laying them on the road so that the colt won't get his feet dirty while he walks in, right? This is how you welcome the king. And this is what they're saying, they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And what they're doing here is they're actually quoting a prophecy about the Messiah from Psalm 118. Where it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're saying, Jesus you are the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And the Messiah, the prophecy is that he'll be a king like David, in the line of David. And they're saying, Jesus, you're the blessed king of our father David, and you're coming to take your kingdom. And they're yelling out this word. It's such a powerful word. I wish I had time to preach just on this word. It's such a good word. But, but they're yelling out this word, Hosanna. 
And a lot of people think that Hosanna means like, you know, uh, hallelujah or praise God. But what Hosanna actually means is it means save now. <laughs> I think that's a good prayer for us to pray in the midst of this time that we're in, right? When there's a pandemic sweeping the whole earth is to pray on Palm Sunday, God, Hosanna. It's like Hosea na. That's what it says. Save us now, God. Right, and they're crying out, God, save us now, right? And, 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 and the thing is, this is like this incredible climax. Like, I can't imagine how the disciples must have been feeling at this moment. They're like, that's Jesus, we're, we're with him, right? Yeah, like that's, that's our boy, right? We're about to come into this city, we're about to take over, we're about to throw out the Romans, and we're about to reign and rule with Jesus in his kingdom for eternity because that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. They're wrong, right? That's, that's not what Jesus was coming to do at this moment. But even think about how Jesus was feeling, right? Jesus, in his heart, it, like God has been reaching out to the people of Israel for hundreds of years, and they've been rejecting him and failing him, and, and now they're welcoming him as their Savior and their Messiah. I, I can't, and Jesus has put his whole life into this. Like Jesus, he, he comes into Jerusalem and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times have I wanted to gather you in my wings like a, like a hen gathers her chicks, right? He's speaking the same way God would speak about them. That's his heart towards them. And it's this climactic moment, right? But, but here's the thing. It's actually an anticlimax. And I was going to prepare this message for you guys about, oh, you know, receiving the Lord as king and... Hosanna, and I really just felt like the Lord totally redirected my heart. To, because, because here's the thing, this is, this is not the climax of Jesus' ministry. It feels like it is, but these very same crowds, right? Not a lot of people think about the crowds as a character in the story, but the crowds are actually one of the most important characters in the Gospels because they show the love of God for his people. Right, these very same crowds who are hailing Jesus as Messiah and King and Lord, literally five days later, Pilate is going to look at them and say, what should I do with this man, Jesus? And with blood in their eyes, they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Right, they go from their, their greatest moment of worship and walking as the people of God, receiving the Messiah, to their greatest moment of failure and rejecting God in five days. Right, and I think that we can relate to that sometimes. I think that we can understand what that's like, that, that there are some times in our lives where we're not living in the fullness of who we are, where we fail, where we reject God. And, and, and I want to open this up because the way that Jesus responds to them is the way that he responds to us. So, so, so Pilate, you know, he's the Roman ruler of this area. He's trying to keep Judea under control, even though the Jews are kind of a rowdy bunch, right? He's trying to do his best. And he says, oh, no, no, I don't, don't, don't make me crucify Jesus. He hasn't done anything. Let, let, me, let me release to you Jesus, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll crucify Barabbas instead, this terrorist and this murderer. And they cry out. They're like, no, crucify him. Crucify Jesus. We want Barabbas. We want this terrorist. Right? And then they deliver him to Roman soldiers, and it's this crazy Parallel, right? Jesus has been hailed as the king and the Messiah. And then he, they deliver him over to the Roman shoulders, soldiers and they dress him in a purple robe. And they put a crown of thorns on his head and they beat him and they, and they mock him like he's a fake king. And then he, they take him, they, well before that they bring him before the Sanhedrin and, and it's the high priests of God, the God's people, right? These are the high priests. And they look at Jesus and they spit in his face and they call him a blasphemer. And then even when they subject him to the cross, right, they put him on the cross, which is the most painful, the most shameful death in the Roman world, right, in the world at the time. Even while he's on the cross, they look at him, up at him and they say, these crowds, right, these people who Jesus was there to save, he was their Messiah. They look up at, uh, at him and they say, if you're really a king... If you're really the Messiah, if you really save, why can't you save yourself? And they blaspheme him. And every time I read this part of the Gospels, 
I, I get tears in my eyes. Not, not because of what they're doing to Jesus, but because, and that's sad, but, but, but it's the way, it's the only way. Jesus knows it's the cup he has to drink from the Father, right? But, but the reason that it breaks my heart every time I read this is because I think about Jesus' heart while they're rejecting him. Right? All the way through this moment, literally, like, you think about it, you know, we think sometimes that God is angry with us. We think that sometimes God is, gets frustrated with us. We think that sometimes God is always pushing us away and always getting mad at us when we sin. But when we look at this moment, the way Jesus responds to his people rejecting him, it shows us what his heart is for us in the middle of our sin. Right? Jesus, what, what is he doing this whole time? Right? He, he's, they're rejecting him. They're beating him. He could have defended himself. He could have gotten angry. He could have shown them that he was really the one who was in charge. He, could have, he says he could have called down legions of angels, right, to defend him and to give them what they deserve. And sometimes that's how we think God responds to us when we fail and we reject him, is that he wants to give us what we deserve. Right, but Jesus doesn't do any of that. He doesn't do any of it. You know what he does do? In the midst of their rejection, while they're rejecting him, while they're mocking him, he is laying down his life so that they can be forgiven. Jesus is a prophet and, and a savior to us, but he's a prophet and a savior to Israel first. And even while Israel is rejecting him, even while they're mocking him and killing him, he's in the middle of dying for them. And, and Luke includes this extra saying of Jesus in this moment that the other gospels don't record. He, he, he records this thing that, 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 that when Jesus is first being crucified, we see his heart come through in this moment. He looks up to the Father, and he cries out, and this is what he says. This is Jesus' heart in the midst of our rejection, in the midst of our failure. This is his heart. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's pause. <laughs> That's powerful. Right? You know, Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't look at them. It's, it's like he doesn't look at them and say, God, give them what they deserve, these heathens, these terrible people. He looks up at the Father and he says, Father, forgive them. You know what's crazy to me about this statement? Is it's, it's, we know that it's not even totally true. Because these same crowds hailed Jesus as the Messiah literally five days ago. They do know. But Jesus' heart chooses not to look at the evil that they're doing. He, even in the midst of his people rejecting him, he still chooses to see what, what only he can see. He still chooses to believe in them. He still in his heart is for them. He still in his heart is pursuing them. And he's crying out and he's saying, God, please, they don't know what they're doing. Like, you just, I know they do, but, but come on, like, look at them. They're your people. He's like, don't give them what they deserve. That's the heart of the Father. Amen. And it, it literally, like, it, it, it's this crazy, tragic irony in the story. If you read it, I encourage you this week in Luke or in any of the Gospels to read the Passion from, from the Palm Sunday story all the way to Jesus' resurrection. It's so powerful because literally, if you think about it, Every drop of blood that Jesus shed on the cross, that's our hope, the cross, amen? Every drop of blood he shed on the cross, he shed it for the people who were crucifying him while they were crucifying him. Right? Even in, while they're in the midst of breaking his heart, he's making the choice to lay his life down for him for them. I think that the way that Jesus loves them in this moment shows the power of the broken, bleeding love of the heart of God. Misty Edwards has this song that I love. Um, it's called Arms Wide Open. Anybody know that song, Arms Wide Open? If you, if you don't know it, you should check it out. It's so good. And she, the whole song is about what does love look like? You know, I've been trying to figure this out. What does love look like? And this is what she says. She uses the cross as an image, and she says this. She says, this is what love looks like. Love looks like arms wide open, a heart exposed. Right? It's arms wide open, a heart exposed, bleeding, she says. 
Right, and this is, this is the picture of the love of God for his people, is that, that while, even while they're in the midst of their greatest moment of rejection and failure, his arms are wide open, even while their teeth are mocking him, he looks at them and he sees who they were created to be, and he says, my arms are wide open, my heart is exposed for you. Right, you think about, it's not even just the people of Israel, right? It's, it's, it's Peter. Right, Peter in this, it does the same exact thing. He, he makes this vow to Jesus. Jesus is like, Peter, I hate to tell you this, bro. He probably didn't say bro. That's my young language coming out. But he says, he says Peter, I hate to tell you this, but you're going you're gonna to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And guys, if Peter can, do, if Peter can fail like this, then we can fail like this. And the longer you live, I think, I think the, longer, the more you realize that, that there's this weakness in us as human beings that sometimes we find ourselves failing. Right? We can try to deny it. We can try to hide it. We can cover, try to cover it up with some nice charismatic language. But, but the truth is, 1 John 4, it says this. It says, it says, if you say that you don't have any sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. Right? And Peter, Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, Satan is, wants to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Anyway, but he says, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter is like, no, Lord, I'll go to prison and to death for you. Right? He makes this great statement. He says, Jesus, I'm your number one guy. I will die for you. And, and not even, like one day later, Peter is standing before a servant girl and he denies Jesus because he's for his own for the, for the fear of what will happen to him, for the fear of how he's going to be rejected or discomforted or imprisoned or whatever. He says, no, I don't even know him. And this is what it says. I, 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 well, it's, I, I won't read it to you, but this, it, it says that when the rooster crowed after Peter had denied the third time, the Lord turned and he looked right at Peter. Luke records this. Right? He, he turns, and I don't know what Peter must have seen in Jesus' eyes in that moment. Right? The disappointment of Jesus' heart, the brokenness of Jesus' heart. But, but Peter, too, goes from his greatest moment of worship to his greatest moment of failure, and just like that. But the thing is, guess what? When Jesus was dying on the cross, you know who he had on his mind? Peter. He died for Peter. Because even though Peter was proving his, his worthlessness, even though Peter was proving his ability to fail, even though Peter was breaking Jesus' heart, right? Jesus looked at him and he said, Peter, I know there's more for you. My heart is for you. Father, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. And I think like, you know, as much as we want to think that we sometimes are holier than the, than the people of Israel, right? What, is, what does Hebrews say? It says these things were written down for our instruction, <laughs> right? But as much as we want to think that we're holier than Peter and, and the people of Israel, the truth is that we can be the same way, right? We can fall back into our old ways. How many of you know quarantine, for some of y'all who struggle with addiction, right? Quarantine can be a tough time. Because it's easy to fall back into your old ways. It's easier to fall back into your old habits. Right? Sometimes we, we hurt the people we love when we said we wouldn't do it again. We said we wouldn't say that thing again. We said we wouldn't do that thing again. We said we wouldn't do it again. We break our promises. How many of you know when we're stuck at home with our families and we're grinding on each other? It's been two weeks now, almost three weeks, right? Like we can hurt each other. Right? Sometimes we can let fear and anxiety and depression rule in our lives and even like let what the world is saying dictate our reality more than we let God dictate our reality. And in the middle of it, God's heart, we, we can be the ones who reject him. We can be the ones who fail him. It's the weakness that we deal with as human beings. But here's the thing, guys. Jesus loves us while we were yet sinners. When we look at these people of Israel, when we look at Peter, we realize that Jesus 
loved them while they were in the middle of their worst rejection, while they were in the middle of their worst failure, while they were in the middle of their greatest moment of weakness, Jesus believed in them and he loved them. And while they were doing it, he died so that they could be forgiven. You know, the problem is that we think that sin separates us from God's love. Guys, this, is the, this, I think, is one of the biggest lies that we deal with as the people of God, is that our sin separates us from God's love. We think, oh, why would God love me? How could God trust me? How could God believe in me? And, and, and before we are willing to receive God's love and believe that he loves us, we, we, we hold God at arm's length. Right? We're like, oh, God, let me make it up to you. Right? God, let me, let me, try, to, let me try to be a little bit better before... Like, I know you're kind of mad. You know, I, I, I need to take some time and pray. I need to take some time and be a little bit better off. I need to take some time and get a little more distance from my addiction before me and you are cool. Right, and we make these plans, right? We make plans like, God, oh, here's how I'm never going to do it again. Here's how I know I'll never fail you again. Just like Peter said, God, Jesus, I'll go to prison and to death for you. Right, we make these plans to try to deal with our own weakness, but the truth is that that weakness is still there. And... But, but here's the thing, when we look at the cross of Christ, the fact that Jesus died to forgive us even when we were in our worst moment of sin, it changes everything. It does. It changes everything. It reminds us the cross is the thing that we cling to because it's the definitive answer. It's the definitive thing that we cling to that says, Jesus loved us even while we were in the middle of our sin. His love never depended. Like, how, how could it be that? How could, how could our sin separate us from God's love? Right? If it didn't separate us from his love when he was dying to save us, how could it separate us from his love now? Right? It, it, it never depended on us loving him back. It never depended on our righteousness. It never depended on our goodness. It never depended on our response. He loved us while we were still sinners. This is what Paul says in Romans 5.8. He says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10 says this, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This, like, love doesn't come from us getting our stuff together. Love doesn't come from us fixing ourselves up. Love comes from us realizing that he loved us first, and he died for us while we were still sinners. Guys, while I was still far from God, while I was still a child of wrath, it says in Ephesians, he loved me. Manny gave a word about but God, before the service, and, and I just think of that, that phrase. That's my favorite part in Ephesians 2. We just read that, like, what, two weeks ago, last week. It says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, raised us up with Christ and seated us, right? It's, it's so powerful. And, 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 like, I wrote this down, right? It's, it's not... It's not us changing our hearts that brings us into God's love. It's coming into God's love that changes our hearts. That's what 1 John is saying right here. It's, it's not repenting. It's not repentance that allows us to receive God's love. It's receiving his love that allows us to repent. Right? Because the word says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. I was, I, I'm going to throw this in. It's not in my notes. I was talking to my friend this week. Or, and, and he was saying, dude, I don't know what it is, but my faith seems so dead. I feel like everything that I used to feel with God has just been so dead for like the last three, four months. I don't know why I just have, like, I know I could read my Bible, right? How many of you guys know in quarantine we have t literally the best opportunity we're ever going to have, probably, to develop this friendship with the Holy Spirit that we seek and that we pray for, right? And he's like, dude, I just don't want it. I don't know what it is. I just want my sin. Honestly, I'm falling back into pornography. I'm doing this again. I'm doing that again. And I'm, I'm thinking about breaking up with my girlfriend. And I'm just like, dude, he's, I, he, I was like, you know what I think you're missing? I was like, it's God's love. Because you think God is waiting for you to get your stuff together. 
before he's going to love you again. You think God's waiting for you to get your stuff together to start reading your Bible again and doing the things again and being a better Christian and loving your girlfriend again before he's going to bring all this life back into your relationship. But bro, that is called legalism. That's the law. What you need is to realize that God loves you now. He loves you now. He loved you when you were in your sin. He loved you when you didn't even know him. He loved you when you were addicted. He loved you. He didn't just love you like, oh, yeah, like I know he's going to be better someday. No, he loved you then. I'm going to say this again. It's not changing our hearts that brings us into God's love. It's God's love that changes our hearts. Come on. And so as I've been thinking about this, I want to transition a little bit because, you know, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about what this forgiveness looks like in our lives. Because I, God hasn't just forgiven us, but, but Jesus says that, that anyone who is unwilling to forgive, I won't forgive him. It's pretty intense. Jesus doesn't mess around. Right, Jesus, he's saying, if you've really received this kind of forgiveness that I've given to you, then you're going to begin to forgive others. Right, there's a lot of important things that we can do in the Christian life, right? We can, we can worship, we can pray, we can take communion, we can gather together. There's all these things that are really important for us to do, but, but there's almost nothing more important than forgiveness. Not only because it's, it's our worship to God, but also because it sets us free. Right, when we carry along grudges, you know, it's, we're not actually binding the person who we're unwilling to forgive. We're actually binding ourselves. I stole that one from Stu. Stu always says that. Right? That's a good one. He said it's for free. Um, <laughs> no, he didn't say anything. Um, no, but, um, <laughs> no, but um, you know, forgiveness, <laughs> where was I? That was, uh, I'm, I'm here doing stand-up comedy, but... Uh, <laughs> No, but like, you know, it, it sets us free when we forgive. And Jesus says that, that he expects us to forgive in the same way that we've been forgiven. But, but I think that sometimes we get the wrong idea of what forgiveness really looks like. We don't really know the kind of forgiveness that Jesus showed to us where he loved us and he forgave us and he believed in us while we were still in the middle of breaking his heart. While we were still in the middle of, we, he didn't even know yet if we were going to change. Right, he's God, right, so he kind of knows. But he knew even while he was dying for those people that some of them were still going to reject him. But he still dies. He still goes. Right, and I think the, the, the picture of forgiveness that we so often get is, is just what we get on the playground at school, right? It's like, okay, so... I, uh, you know, oh, little Billy hit me, right? Little Billy comes up, hits me. Oh, man, and we run to the teacher, right? And the teacher says, okay, you know, Bobby, what did Billy do? And Bobby, this is, I'll be Bobby. Bobby's like, Billy hit me. And then it's like, okay, Billy, say you're sorry. Billy says, oh, I'm sorry. And then I say, oh, okay, Billy, I forgive you. Right, but the model of forgiveness that we're taught is you forgive as an acceptance of somebody's apology, right? But forgiveness goes so far beyond that, right? Because this, guys, this is, the, this is something that tears marriages to shreds. I hope you hear me. I actually wrote this me message for marriages, to be honest. That's what's on my heart while I was preparing this message. Because if, if I'm only willing to forgive you and believe the best about you after you show me some signs of change and apologize then boy, those walls are going to go up real quick. Right. Guys, human relationships cannot survive with forgiveness that only forgives once you change. That's right. That's right. They can't. Because that's the truth about us, is that we have sin. We make mistakes. Right? And God has set us free. That's not our destiny. We're not destined to be sinners. I don't come up here and say, oh, I'm a filthy sinner, brother. No, but I'm not going to deny the fact that I fail. Right? Because Paul, because John says, if you're doing that, then you're deceiving yourself. Right? And, and this, this is the love that Jesus shows us is the kind of love that forgives even while somebody is still in the middle of hurting you. Even while somebody is still in the middle of doing that thing that they always do that drives you nuts. Right? Now listen to me. Here's what I'm not saying. Because in our society today, everybody wants to 
write the asterisk and, and talk about the exception, right? If you're in an abusive relationship, if you're in a relationship where somebody keeps on abusing you, they don't care about you, they want what they want, they're going to keep hurting you, hurting you, hurting you, hurting you, I'm not telling you to stay in that relationship with that person. You need to put up boundaries. Now, I'm not, in, a, in a marriage, there's, you've made a covenant, so you need to talk to somebody, you need to get some help, right? But, but if, if, there's, if somebody is abusing you, you there are, there's a place to put up boundaries, right? But, but we sometimes want to make that exception the rule, right? There's a place to say, hey, I'm not going to stay around and just be a doormat. I'm not saying that that's what you need to do. But here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus, isn't ta- Jesus is talking not like there are some times where we're not being abused, but we're being disappointed over and over again. We're being frustrated over and over again. We're being hurt over and over again. And the disciples say, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Jesus says 70 times seven. Is it seven times, Jesus? He says, when that person keeps doing that, you keep forgiving them. You keep saying, I think there's really two parts of forgiveness. Number one is you say, hey, you don't owe me anymore. Right? I'm not going to hold what you did over your head anymore. And not only that, but, but, but there's a second part that I think is really important, which is this, that you continue to believe, you, you make a choice to believe the best about that person. And that's the part that we miss, right? Because this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And I think there's this part of forgiveness that is wrapped up in believing in the other person. Like, this is the part that's changed my heart about love the most. Is like, I, there were many times in my early marriage, I can remember with Katie, being like, oh, yeah, I've forgiven Katie, but the Lord tapped on my heart and he said, yeah, but are you believing the best about her? Are you believing that she's not always going to be like this? Are you believing that, that, that I can make a change? Not in her herself, because none of us have the power in ourselves to make a change. But are you looking with my eyes to see what I could do in their life? Are you looking like that? And I actually think that this is the true test of forgiveness. This is the test of true forgiveness. I, I'm sorry, that's what I mean. This is the test of true forgiveness. It's like, oh yeah, they don't know me anymore. But the question is... Uh, uh, when you ask them, oh, but what do you think about them? Oh, well, let me tell you about them. Let me tell you how, what I know about them. Now, I'm not saying that we should, like, just cover over people's mistakes. I'm not saying we should just, just not pay attention when people aren't doing things that they should do. I'm not saying that. Don't, don't hear that. That's not what I'm saying. But, with, but I'm talking about for you personally, do you need to repent? Do you need to, like, are you really believing the best for the person that you said you've forgiven? And I think we say, oh, you know, isn't that a little reckless? You know, but that's, that's how God loves. God loves recklessly. God, that's why, you know, Corey Asbury wrote that song, Reckless Love. It's like, okay, you know, oh, God can't be reckless, Corey. Come on. God's perfect. But he's like, no, this is, by human standards, this love does not make sense. To keep believing in those people of Israel, even when they're killing him, even when they're, they're, they're cutting him down, even when they're making him bleed, he's bleeding for them. That's the love of God. Can I tell you something? God is recklessly optimistic about you. He's recklessly optimistic about you. Right now, if you're in the middle of your sin, even if you're in the middle of the worst failures and mistakes of your life, God, when he looks at you, he loves you, and his desire is your forgiveness. It's, it's, this, is, this is what keeps marriages together. This is what keeps fathers and sons together, right? There's so many fathers and sons who they don't talk to each other anymore because of some offense that happened. Ten years ago, five years ago. Right, guys, this, this kind of forgiveness that loves even while we're still in the middle of our sin is the kind of forgiveness that changes the world. It's the love of God on the cross. So I want to close with this, and I'm going to welcome the worship team to come back up. Do you, do you need to believe again that God 
heart, that his heart is to forgive you? Do you need to believe again that God believes in you, even in the middle of your failures and your mistakes? Do you need to believe again that God isn't just waiting on you to get your stuff together? Because when you begin to experience this love again, your heart comes alive. It's amazing. Like we get cut in this, we get so stuck in desert seasons and dry seasons because we forget that it's all about us being kids who receive the free love of the Father, even with our failures, even with our blemishes, even with our mistakes. This is what I told my friend. I was like, bro, you need to realize that God loves you. He always loved you. And if we want to go back to our first love, where does our first love come from? David says, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You know what the joy of your salvation is? It's when you realize no matter what I do, no matter how much I mess up, it doesn't depend on me. It depends on his love. It, depend, it always depended on him because he loved us. He loved me when I was far away. How can I, why would I hold myself at arm's length from him? Right. And the second question I want to ask you is this, and you guys can start playing, is, is there somebody that you need to forgive? Is there somebody that maybe you need to repent and you need to say, Lord, I've, I haven't really chosen to truly forgive. I, I've been hanging on to grudges. I've been hanging on to little things. I've been, I've been making judgments about people that I'm unwilling to let go of. If that's you, I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're even there with your family and, and there's somebody in your family that you need to forgive. Maybe you just need to look at them. Maybe there's somebody in your family you need to repent to and say, hey man, I've been a huge jerk and you've been so gracious to me. Would you just forgive me? But I just feel like the Lord has so much to release to us this week. We got a word in the prophetic time that, that this week with this message is a preparation for the Passover. It's a preparation for us receiving the body and blood of the Lord this coming Friday. And I want to welcome you guys out to that as we're going to broadcast it. It's going to be good. Um, but yeah, can we just worship together? We're going to just go back into a short time of worship. And, and yeah, maybe that's you. Maybe you need to receive forgiveness or maybe you need to give it. So Lord, we just come before you right now and we thank you for the love that loved us while we were still in our sin, that loved us while we were yet sinners, God. And we pray that you'd pour it out on us right now, Jesus. Come on, let's worship him.
Yes, Lord. As they were worshiping, I got a picture of uh, just a family standing in a circle, uh, holding hands together. It was a couple kids and and just a husband and wife. And basically, they just decided that they were going to start this lifestyle of repentance. This was a this was a good word that Jake shared here on just forgiveness and how we receive the forgiveness of the Father and we f- we receive His love. And then we begin to walk in a lifestyle of repentance. And it might look different for each family. It might be that, hey, as we're spending more and more time together, uh, we're getting on each other's nerves and we need to repent to one another of that. Or it might be your reaction to your workplace as this has been a tough time. Um, It might even be your reaction to your government and how they're handling this situation. But I believe there's What I saw in the picture was as that started to happen, there was a fireball that fell from heaven and it was Holy Spirit that was gonna show up in your living room. As you you begin to walk out this lifestyle of repentance, as you begin to repent to one another and forgive one another, that this, this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is gonna fall so powerfully in your living rooms. I believe this, I declare this in Jesus' name. Lord, we are just so thankful. We are so thankful for what you've brought tonight. We are thankful for the word worship. 
And Father, we, we believe and we receive your forgiveness. We, we believe that we're innocent, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We believe that we're innocent. And then we also believe that when our innocent lines up with this lifestyle of repentance, Lord, you are going to show up in a powerful way. And we just declare this into the living rooms tonight and, um, and to this morning, Lord. And we just thank you so much for what you're going to do. We believe that there's going to be testimonies that come forth from this repentance and what it looks like to walk out a lifestyle of repentance, Lord. We just believe that you're going to show up in a powerful way, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we thank you so much for uh, joining us um, and just tuning in and uh, for Jake's word. And if you have anything that you want to share or you want to uh, just, yeah, contact, contact us about, feel free to do that. Uh, we're so thankful, and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. So let it rise like incense my whole life A fragrance every ounce here broken at your feet And every breath is an offering